Okay, look at this fancy guy with his fancy music. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the platform. It is Saturday, which means it is time for another content report. If you want to discover cool engine features and find creative ways to use them to create your games, then head on over to theconceptbay.net, sign up for the All Access Pass, and get access to all the production videos available on the platform. Let's go ahead and take a look at the progress we've made this week. During this week, our Tag Rise project has benefited the most from all the development time it got. We continue making our way through the previous features of the Game Maker Studio version of the game, porting over a whole bunch of mechanics and improving on a heck of a lot of new sprites and designs for the same mechanics. I've actually reworked pretty much everything there is to rework in terms of mechanics and obstacles and hazards, and I am actually really glad that I did. The new designs are so so much better than the old stuff. Mainly because the old stuff is saturated to its very core with inexperience and experimentation and learning. It really shows in the quality of those old sprites, so I'm kind of happy that uh, I decided to go with the complete redesign. In this episode, we were working on the pressure plate. A pressure plate is a simple obstacle that slams down a heavy piston into the ground, and unlike the previous rendition of the game, the piston is now fully dynamic which means that I can custom set the depth at which the piston is going to be falling. Whereas in the previous version, the piston had a preset length. And it was essentially a disc that spins around and slams a pressure plate onto the ground at a predefined distance. I reckon this feature will add a new dimension of possibilities to the sort of puzzle and traversal mechanics and traversal challenges that we can build out of these pieces. Another thing that you can now do that you couldn't do with the previous piston is jump off of the piston sides. This feature is bound to add a new dimension to the level traversal possibilities. In the next episode, we create the saw cannon. This little obstacle is essentially a saw flinging mechanism present throughout the legacy version of our tag rise. As I said before, every single asset here has gone through some sort of a redesign, including this one. Compared to the old one, I find that this one is a heck of a lot more legible now. And the saw blade itself now has a couple of markers for us to tell which direction is the saw spinning in. Now, it's not that the direction of spin actually matters, it's more about legibility. Because now you can actually tell that it's a spinning object as opposed to some sort of a static glowy ball, which you can very easily misinterpret as a fireball. The next item on the list that needs to be ported over is the following obstacle in front of you. This is dubbed the laser bridge, although it's not a very good bridge, since if you attempt to cross it, you will get a pretty major case of toasty nuts. In a nutshell, this is essentially a laser beam that is connected by two laser emitting units. You place them in your level and you essentially get a brightly connected line of red hot death. This whole system is very quite dynamic. The two lasers come in a single scene, they come in a pair. I just need to deploy them in the level, position them wherever I want, and they are already connected, they already rotate towards one another, they already position and stretch the laser beam, they already automatically establish all the collisions and all the necessary dimensions, all I have to do is deploy it in a level, position it, and that is it. There are plenty of mechanics that need to be ported, and one of them is this bar graph, or the bar counter. Essentially, it's an accumulative switch that counts how many switches that are connected to it are turned on, and it fills up the bar graph relative to that amount. Again, this has to be a dynamic system. I can connect two switches, I can connect one switch, I can connect a hundred switches to it. It should not care regardless. And the next item on the list is, of course, the switch itself. This switch is gonna be wall-mounted, and I'm gonna end up adding a some sort of a ground-mounted box, which we can attach the switch to in a dynamic fashion, so I don't have to create a whole separate resource just for a ground-mounted switch. So this one will stick from the wall. It has a glowing handle, so you can tell it in the dark. It will start with a warm orange, and when it switches on, it will switch to a bright green. And we set it up in such a way where we can set the color of the handle using Godot Engine's code instead of it being hard-coded or hard-baked into the texture itself. 
We employed a little bit of sprite trickery to fake the effect of the crank being pulled down. It wasn't quite as simple as just scaling the crank handles going from up to down position because at some point they get so thin that you can clearly tell it's a flat image. So we had to create additional elements that overlay and move on top of the crank to simulate as if it's a 3D object. We finished up by programming the switch switching mechanic, which also included us popping up a little user interface prompt with a controller key. This will indicate to the player that they are close enough to the switch to actually trigger it. And at this point, as I'm programming the switch, I am trying to predict all the different challenges that I can really make with such a simple system. Which is why, as a precaution, just for future-proofing this feature, I have programmed it in such a way where the single switch is capable of triggering an infinite amount of items, an infinite amount of objects or triggerable systems in the game. Not only that, multiple switches can all trigger the same item, which could make for some pretty interesting, almost logic-based, uh, maybe computer-based puzzle-solving mechanics. In any case, the system is dynamic enough to leave plenty of room to expand for these sort of uh, interesting puzzles. One of the final things we've handled in this project is importing and programming the bar graph or the switch counter. For the visual aesthetic, I've decided to go with the liquid filler that has bubbles flowing in parallax over it. And to wrap up the code mechanics for all these features, we have gotten the bar graph to communicate with every single switch it's supposed to scan and collect the data on whether or not the switches are on or off. You can connect, just like with the switches, any amount of inputs for the bar graph to scan. So the bar will proportionally scale itself depending on how many switches it needs to scan in the first place. Again, I'm trying to think ahead of time to make a system that is flexible and scalable. Switches that can trigger an unlimited amount of objects, bar graphs that can scan an unlimited amount of switches, and other inputs, saw cannons and pressure plates which have custom properties which you can set on per saw cannon or pressure plate basis. The saw cannons can be set to shoot the saw blades with a certain interval and at a specific speed. The pressure plates can slam down at a certain speed, wait at the bottom for a certain amount of time, then rise up at a different speed and wait up top for a different pause period and all of these obstacles are capable of accepting input methods and the last episode for this week for this project was all about the nice little things little particles for the saw cannons as you can see the saw blades when they hit the solid object now spawn a set of particles you can see that the lasers are now spawning particles as well and oh yeah we have physics based blood particles these are going to be kind of fun because they actually interact with the player object, meaning that the player can be obstructed by a blood particle or he can actually jump off the blood particle. I'm pretty sure I'll end up including some sort of a toggle mechanic that allows you to disable this functionality, but uh, yeah, it's an extra challenge and it might actually be fun when you play with your friends. I mean, come on, these are physics-based particles. Those things are always fun. So we got some ambient particles for the bar graph, we got some ambient particles for the lasers, we got the player death blood. Many of these things were already present in the original game, but my goodness, do these things look a heck of a lot better in this port than they are in the original. This game, like many other games I'm working on, is heavily story-based, so I'm working on this while there is stuff to work on. At some point, I will reach the moment where the story will be pretty much dictating what it is that I'm working on next. And without the story, there will be no development. Which is why, while I have this to-do list of all the basic core mechanics that I have to port over, I'm trying to educate myself on storytelling and story writing and screenplay. Because once I run out of things to port, everything else that's being developed will be heavily influenced and pretty much entirely based on where the story takes these characters. So that is it for our tag rise. Let's go ahead and move on to the next project.
with Dream Team Theater, work continues towards setting up a dynamic weapon generation system. My task right now is, as it was last week, is to create a variety of front barrels, back bodies, and handles for the weapon varieties. As a matter of fact, not only do we have to create all of these bits, each will have to get its own texture. Now, of course, we're going to have a global texture set. So we're going to have a yellow rusty texture, a black chrome texture, and all of these various bits will have to have a texture created after one of these sets. Now, because I'm using Substance Painter, I'm pretty sure a bulk of that task is going to be handled by creating a smart material, which I will dub the theme of a single texture set, and I'll be able to just drag and drop that theme onto a single part. There will of course be plenty of manual work, but I think uh, I might be able to streamline this process. The whole idea here is of course to create a variety of weapon parts and then we'll be able to dynamically generate randomly shaped weapons with random statistics and random textures on the fly. All of this is done as a possible solution to tackle the problem of variety for this sort of a game. A game that is heavily based on loot and having an abundance of weapons with various statistics. Now, random weapon generation aside, for that you can just watch the uh, time lapse of me creating these weapons. I've been pondering on the story for this particular project. Now, until this point, this has pretty much been just a regular Nazi Zombies project. It's a uh, hordes based waves of enemies, stand your ground for as long as you can until you die, sort of a game. But the more I work on this project, the more I feel like it deserves a story. And this is usually the rabbit hole that I go down to when projects just get out of the scope and way too big. But what the hell? Who knows? I've already worked with one voice actor to get the voice lines for the merchant, and they sound phenomenal. And now I have filed a second order with a different voice actor for the role of the host of the game show. This is uh, the character of Ronan Fletcher, the charismatic businessman, cold-blooded host of the reality show inside of which you are participating. Now, before I started thinking about the story for this game, this character was just a blank, rundown villain. But the more I think of the story, the more I feel inclined that this character deserves a proper backstory and an honorable character arc not only because this would greatly improve the quality of the game and the quality of the character, but also that if I am paying to record voice lines for this character, it is probably a good idea to make sure that those voice lines are worth recording. Those voice lines are bringing something about the character to the table. Not to mention, out of respect for the voice actors who are putting their best into voicing these characters, I'm sure that the freelance actors would appreciate to put their best foot forward for a role that is worth doing so. So let's talk about what sort of character the host is. The host name is Ronan Fletcher. He used to be, just like the player, the participant in the very same underground survival show which the player finds himself surviving in now. Ronan has a young, rebellious daughter who is completely against the deeds of her father. She actually takes active participation in the hindering all of his plans. However, unknowingly that Ronan is sacrificing everything he has in order to keep her out of the clutches of the corporation, which is responsible for running the very show he is supposed to be the host of. The corporation makes up the ultimate and absolute evil in the game, and Ronan is bound by the contract to keep the the recruitment and the show running, which as a result promises to keep his daughter out of harm's way of the corporation. Ronan, once full of passion to destroy the corporation, now has to work for the same evil he sought to destroy in order to keep his daughter safe, and with every rebellious act, his daughter ends up putting herself closer and closer to the danger without even realizing so. Ronan sees his daughter as a helpless child who needs to be shielded, even though she is now a young adult who has yet to get a chance to showcase her responsibility. 
Not that his daughter starts the story already being a responsible woman denied a chance. No, she indeed starts as a close-minded, rebellious child without a grander scope of the situation at hand. And Ronan is stuck between a rock and a hard place where he has to deal with his rebellious daughter in order to keep her safe from harm. Ronan, once seeking to destroy the corporation, now has to become a part of it in order to keep his daughter safe. And his ultimate transformation will come when he frees himself from the shackles of the corporation by rebelling against them and ultimately freeing his daughter by sacrificing himself in a fight against the onslaught of the creatures and machines which he in part had developed for the use of the very show which the players are participating in. Ronan will start his journey viewing his daughter as a helpless child and has to finish the journey seeing his daughter as an independent responsible woman. In turn, his daughter has to start the story as a rebellious, close-minded child and finish her story by growing and wisening, becoming strong enough to confront hard life decisions, seeing her father for his sacrifices and maturing by taking over her father's ultimate goal of taking down the corporation, a goal which her father had to sacrifice in order to keep his daughter safe and out of harm's way. Ultimately, the family starts broken up and the family comes together, with the daughter taking over the dad's dream of clearing the world of the corporation's evil deeds. Thus, Ronan, by recognizing the strength of his daughter and letting her go, he completes his own dream and his own goal and his own life's mission of taking down the corporation. Ronan is shackled by the contract to the corporation and his freedom comes at a cost of his sacrifice. However, dramatically speaking, he achieves freedom from the shackles of the corporation by standing up and rebelling against the corporation himself with the main goal of his rebellion being the task of getting his daughter out of this underground survival show and getting it out of the zone controlled completely by the corporation. His entire story wraps up to ends, his slavery to the corporation and the mending of his relationship with his daughter. Albeit that comes with a sacrifice, it is a sacrifice worth making. Ronan's daughter, in turn, grows and matures by witnessing and finally comprehending the scope and the magnitude of the sacrifices her father has done for her. And finally, deciding to take on the fight against the corporation herself, now in a much grander scope than her simple rebellious pranks. She grows as an individual, having experienced her first sacrifice, and takes on the corporation herself. For the other characters in the game, the merchant ends up getting a bit of a story himself, him being one of the three participants which Ronan, the host, was running with during the early days of the show. His story arc starts with him being a callous, selfish man, living for himself, surviving by himself, and being the least reliable character you can put your trust in. His character transformation comes in the form of a one-way ticket rescue mission to help the host get his daughter out. His story is the story of honor and redemption of one's self-worth. Likewise, his freedom and his redemption comes at a price of personal sacrifice. Aside from these characters and and the player, there are no more characters presently in the game. Canonically speaking, the original trio was made up of Ronan, the merchant in his human form, and a third lady character with whom Ronan ended up falling in love with and having a daughter with, only to then be taken away by the corporation as a means of sending a message. This is the state of the story as of this moment, and while I have things to work on this project, I have the time to read, learn, and write the screenplay for these characters. This is all that I have for the Dream Team Theater project for this week. Let's go ahead and move on to the next project. For the Accursed Kingdom project, I've ended up rewriting the entire player movement code, considering that the first one was kind of uh, a little bit too jank for my taste. It did the job and it got the thing up and running, but the scalability was a little bit um, 
yeah, so it's a little bit tricky. So the way input was handled now was predominantly by the use of actions, which to be honest, while it gets the job done for a single player game, once you want to scale up to a multiplayer game, every time you add a new button or key command or some sort of a mapping, you kind of have to do this whole dance with setting up variables and setting up various key inputs and detections and it's a pain in the butt, where with the Arteg Rise project, I actually ended up going a different route. Instead of using actions, I pull the controller directly, which allows me to just modify which controller I'm pulling and still keep the same exact code, which performs the checks. So the direction I took in Artag Rise when it comes to detecting user inputs was actually so scalable, I decided to just rework the player and implement that instead. I've also started to question what the purpose of this project is. While the initial rush of having a brand new idea and something cool has pretty much worn off by now, it is time to actually identify what it is that I'm trying to achieve with this project. And in the course of uh, a single episode, uh, at the beginning of a single episode, I ended up doing a little bit of analysis and identifying the core value of the game. I want to create a fun experience to play with your friends. That's the main core of the game, and if I forget about it, that's when the doubts start coming in. That's when I start thinking, where is this project heading, and why am I working on this? If you recall, in the beginning of these videos, this was something that I talked about. Talk about burnout, talk about losing scope, and talk about losing the vision of where the project is supposed to go. So, while the first few videos when I talked about my strategy was all fun and games, now it is not so much fun. Now I yet again come face to face with this beast, that asks me, why are you doing this? This happens all too often when I get lost in the details of the project, working on some tiny little thing instead of uh, concentrating on the global scope of the project. While I work towards identifying the real core value behind this game, what it is that I'm trying to say with this project, to keep the cogwheels moving, I worked on some of the more mundane parts, mainly the furniture, the environment, a new texture tile, and I started playing around with a bit of uh, level layout and basic level geometry just to see what would be fun to traverse. But to be honest, time and time again, I realized that this process is a lot faster and a lot more concise in a 2D drawing application as a sketch or piece of concept art. This has been kind of a difficult week. I haven't made as much progress as I wish I did, not as much progress as I usually do on most of these projects nonetheless. I did end up tapping out all of my upload quota, but some of that is no thanks to a project which has yet to be even published or have a video made on it, so progress-wise I think I can do a lot better. That is all that I have for this week. If you're interested in following these projects and watching the full uncut videos of all the features being developed, all the sprites being drawn, all the code being written, and all the code being explained, head on over to theconceptbait.net, sign up for the All Access Pass, where you get access to all of the videos and all of the production content and all of the tutorials, all under one same membership. Thank you everybody for watching, and I will see you guys next Saturday.